Beginning my undergraduate education in Sierra Leone, West Africa, I had no idea I would end up being an epidemiologist. I've always wanted to be a literature teacher uh, at, the, at the local high school. As time came to go to college, I, I declared my major very early. It was going to be literature, it was going to be English literature, until I came across uh, a professor from the University of Leeds who was uh, on a sabbatical. So I decided to minor in geography and I went on field trips with him. Uh, he started the geography of settlements and one of the field trips we went to was in a very remote village in Sierra Leone. There was no vehicular traffic there, um, so we walked very, very long distances. And I remember sitting uh, around a circle with this professor uh, talking to the translator and the translator explaining that everybody in that village that was age 40 and over was actually blind. And the reason they were blind was because of uh, river blindness. And everybody who was younger than 40 had left town who was an adult. And all there was were children. And you can imagine how poor a society like that would be where there is no labor at all except uh, young children and people who are blind. But when I graduated from Sierra Leone, I, I went back to my native Zimbabwe. And my first real job was working for an epidemiologist. And this epidemiologist worked at the National disease surveillance office. And this is an office where uh, the surveillance experts spend all their time collecting information on who got sick, what sickness they had, and collate all that information, put it together into what is called surveillance reports. The reason we spend so much money on surveillance is so that we all can establish patterns so that we can predict epidemics. This is the local spikes in cases of a particular disease, as well as pandemics, which is the worldwide type spikes that we see today with, uh, with respect to COVID. And this minimizes harm that is caused by such diseases that are sweeping through populations. It also helps us to increase knowledge about which factors contribute to these spikes in, 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 in disease occurrence. For example, a disease that, had, that is like flu, where you have an endemic, meaning it's occurring in the population and we're expecting it, we expect flu to be endemic in the population and have local spikes. And after that, when we see something more than that, we know we have an epidemic. So they, my first real job was working at, with an epidemiologist in the National Disease Surveillance Office. At that time, the disease I was working at had reached pandemic proportions was uh, AIDS, and AIDS was caused by HIV. We now know it is now a chronic disease and you can take one pill for it a day now, but at that time it was a death sentence. And one of the things we found as I was collating this data was that about 30% of pregnant women were infected with HIV at that time. These were very alarming news. After four years of collecting and collating data, compiling it, uh, and producing these reports on how many people were sick, how many people were dying from each disease, um, it became clear that I needed my education. I then went and enrolled at UC Berkeley where I went and studied epidemiology. I did a master's degree there. But really what's important here is that had it not been that professor from Leeds, I probably would be a literature professor today. I probably would have never, ever considered epidemiology as a field of study. So let's talk a little bit about how we actually measure the disease, disease occurrence in human populations. So surveillance data that are produced by the doctor's office, when you go and visit the doctor, go to the state uh, surveillance office, and then those data are shared 
with the Centers for Disease Control, and eventually they are shared with the World Health Organization. This is so that uh, the national and global responses are decided. But, but this only represents the tip of an iceberg because only those cases that show up at the doctor's office are included in the statistics. When we see a spike in the number of cases showing up in the emergency room, doctor's offices, it usually means there are many, many people with the disease that are not reported either because they have no health insurance or they have mild disease symptoms that make them not need to go to the doctors. So when we are looking at these numbers, we always have to think about if we are seeing this number of cases, there's a whole lot more out there that we do not know. So for infectious diseases such as COVID-19, there are four main statistics that have helped authorities decide whether and when to act. The prevalence of cases in a population is what is looked at first. This is the proportion of people in the population that are infected and therefore can infect others. This also projects how many beds we will need if we do actually not mitigate using measures like wearing masks and washing our hands often. And then the other statistic that we look at are the new cases, and this is called incidence. This is how fast the disease is ripping through the population. From this, we also calculate how many days the numbers begin to double or begin to triple, and people actually start talking about the doubling time. It helps assess how well the mitigation efforts, such as wearing masks, are working in the population. Uh, the other statistic that has been difficult to come by is called the reproduction number. This means the number that each infected case in infects or produces. This is also known as the R0, and others call it the R0. By comparison, let's look at the R0 or R0 for recent epidemics. For example, we had Ebola, uh, that was uh, an epidemic in West Africa with, uh, with a lot of people dying. Uh, its reproduction number is two. If you look at HIV, the reproduction number is four. Uh, for SARS, uh, which is the COV-1, we actually, it's about four. And for mumps, it's 10. For measles, which is considered one of the most infectious diseases out there, it's about 18. So one person with measles infects 18 other people on average. For the COVID-19, for the virus that causes COVID-19, we are estimating this at four to six. We're estimating this at four to six based on a lot of this data come out of China. The other statistic that we work with is called the case fatality rate. This is the proportion of people who have the disease that die. This tells us how serious the disease is and whether we need drastic responses like we did with uh, COVID-19 where we had to shut down about 98% of the economy. Except for the R0 that is also based on Chinese data, we are still trying to get closer to what these numbers are in order to decide how best to approach and defeat this pandemic. The problem is that many of these statistics require additional numbers that we still do not have, but we must act. For example, contact tracing that will give us the real R0 for the United States, where we do not live in, in such close quarters as the Chinese, that number we still do not have. Another example of a number we still are trying to zero in on is the case fatality. Because this case fatality depends on whether we agree that any death from a COVID-19 case is a COVID death. In general, this is how we have estimated case fatality in the past for all diseases, and that is how we have ranked them in order of their importance. But there's a lot of challenges to this definition now, as you have heard. So given those, the, 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 the lack of those data, it is really important that we find a common consensus that will help us to keep moving forward. 
The other thing I wanted to mention regarding surveillance data is how the case is defined. How do we decide that this is a case of COVID-19? Broadly speaking, there are two types of tests available out there, and there has been much debate on how best we use these available tests. Some have even suggested that we should test so that if we are positive for the virus that causes COVID-19, we can then get back to work, assuming that we will not get reinfected again. One of these tests is a nucleic acid test that detects the presence of viral particles. As you can imagine, it is very accurate uh, for detecting an active infection and is used successfully for diagnosing people who come to see a healthcare provider with other symptoms such as a fever uh, or chest pains. This test is expensive and slow and requires a swab, which some people find uncomfortable. Um, when a test requires many parts like this, such as reagents and swabs, and when the population deems it uncomfortable, fewer people opt for the test when they are not sick. The other test is an antibody test. It is much cheaper and we have relied on antibody tests that are specific to specific viruses for a very long time in infectious disease. And they have been used to control many, many, including uh, HIV uh, infection. But they tend to be less accurate. This reduced accuracy has made authorities reluctant to use results from this test to make some policy decisions. They are data coming out, for example, in the last week, suggesting that the antibody test itself, that test for this novel virus, may not be as long lived as we previously thought. In fact, this preliminary data suggests that we lose that we are losing this antibody much faster than previously thought and therefore reinfection could occur pretty quickly. The other type of method that we use in surveillance is called syndromic surveillance. This is when a general description is used to make a decision about who is infected or not. For example, there is a thermometer that I'm sure you've heard about that has a GPS that is being used by some to predict where the next COVID-19 spike will be based on the cluster of elevated temperature in, a ge in geographic space. An elevated temperature is one of the flu-like symptoms that is expected with COVID-19 onset. And the problem with this type of test or surveillance method is that it gets a lot of people with high temperatures for other reasons other than COVID-19 and may divert resources to some areas unnecessarily. The take home here is that all tests are useful and have their place in controlling the epidemic, but a highly accurate test performs very poorly in a population with a low prevalence, such as we have with the SARS-CoV-2 infection that is estimated at 1 to 5 percent. For example, if you think about a prevalence such as 1 to 5 percent, a highly accurate test, like the nucleic acid test, for example, will have a positive predictive value of about 50 percent, which is as good as flipping a coin. Here we are thinking about a test that has a 99 percent accuracy sensitivity and specificity. And then you go and apply it to a free living well population, it does not perform well. You can give an example, an example of that would be, say a 20 year old exerciser, you go and test them for heart disease, and then you take the same test and use it on a 90 year old, that has heart problems and other conditions. The test will perform much better in a 90-year-old who has other conditions that are consistent with heart disease than in a 20-year-old who doesn't. 
The good news is that what we are still, while we are still working on what the prevalence, the incidence, the reproduction number, and even what the case fatality numbers are, one thing we know is that mitigation efforts such as wearing masks and washing hands often works. In Vermont, where you do not receive services without a mask, they have not had a single case in the last four days.